All right. Well, welcome to Roots of Reality Experiences. Today I'm joined by Pastor Donovan Price, who is the founder of the victim advocacy and crisis intervention organization called Solutions and Resources, which provides a holistic pathway to the healing of surviving victims of violence in Chicago by providing timely and practical solutions and resources to the community. And lastly, Pastor Price's work has been reported on by various news organizations across the United States. So Pastor Price, thanks for joining me today. Oh, no problem. Thanks for having me. So when did you uh, first realize that you know, gun violence was this issue in your city that compelled you to get involved and try to help out the community? Uh, I started in 2016. Um, there was a nine-year-old, uh, Tyshawn Lee, who was shot and killed, um, kind of uh, actually assassinated. Wow. Uh, back down and shot and killed. And uh, I was working on a... a a prayer initiative um, to kind of follow up the the path he walked on the way home because it it kind of symbolizes all young kids. Um, right. He went, from, he went from school to the park, and um, yeah. and then somebody lured him into an alley, unfortunately, and uh, and that's where he um, lay. Yeah, that's yeah, terrible stuff that goes on. I mean, so you know, prior to you first starting this organization, were you just working? as a pastor or, you know, what was your. Yeah, I had been a minister for some time okay. and uh, I started uh, working with an organization called Pray Chicago. And, uh, and one thing led to another, <laughs> to another from, from sure. that I uh, started uh, a kind of break off organization called Pray Chicago Youth Edition. And, uh, and so I was working on projects for that. And that's how I really became uh, involved with like the Chicago police department's work, uh, the mayor's office, the park district, pretty much everybody, uh, a lot of aldermen, city council, et cetera. And um, sure. yeah, interesting. Okay. Yeah. So they asked me to, the police department asked me to be a part of uh, some of the community stuff they were doing um, with regards to shoot shootings, which were like children or mass shootings, the bigger um, uh, issues. And so um, once I started doing that, it got me in that kind of a victim audience and yeah, i just sure. saw more and more of a need and that's that's where it came from yeah i mean it sounds like that you've been really active in the chicago community for a long time um are and you were, mm -hmm. were you born and raised in chicago as well then absolutely yeah absolutely cool. um so what does your day-to-day -day work look like right now when it's helping you know the, the the victims of gun violence and their families what does that look like um, uh, I mean, basically, because with the shootings and, and homicides, you can never tell when that's going to happen. Yeah. Um, I kind of work around that for the most part. Um, you know, different people I need to contact with or, or, or maybe a event I have to plan or something like that. I, I try to uh, do a regular day, basically. Um, yeah. A lot of days I'm, I have to decompress from something. Uh, that has happened, you know, um, before, but most days I, I, I am just your typical um, pastor working on a, uh, working on events and community stuff and connecting with people. And then I get that text or call or, or alert on my phone and, and that changes everything. Yeah, that's, I mean, it, it sounds like a lifestyle that is, I mean, it's, it's one aspect it's heroic, but also it must be really exhausting because of <laughs> all this work you're yes. doing. Um, and everything you're seeing, I suppose that the people that you relate to the most are probably, you know, the, you know, the victims and the, their families, but also, you know, the other first responders and stuff in the community, because it's hard to imagine for people across the U.S. that, you know, do not interact with these things on a regular basis to understand what's that like and what you must be going through when you're doing all this work. So it's pretty courageous, um, but. Well, I, I think, you know, um, for me, the biggest thing is turning on the pizza and having to turn it off uh, once I've already, you know, all of a sudden have to turn it off and run out the door. Um, yeah. I do have a couple of TV shows that I'm into and, and, and I'm just praying the whole TV show that nothing happens, but sometimes yeah. I miss the whodunit. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, that's my life. I mean, I sleep with um, both of my telephones in the bed with me. And um, throughout the night, I constantly check them. Um, 
I, I leave actually most folks put their phones on vibrate or do not disturb when they go to bed. I actually turn my uh, alerts up when yeah. I get ready to go to bed so that I can hear them and so that I constantly check them and I know how to um, follow, you know, what's happening to know whether I need to go to it or not. Now, when you got involved in this type of work, what was like your family's reaction and your friends, you know? How, did they well, I kind of hid it from everybody. Oh, in the okay. beginning. I didn't yeah. want to, you know, just bust out to the family. Yeah. 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 You know, I felt God telling me to run to homicide scenes. Yeah. yeah. And so I, I remember I kind of hid it from uh, everybody. And I, I think it was my mother and sister. Um, we were sitting down one night. I had just come in from getting some milk. And, okay. uh, and uh, we turned on the news and the first story on the news was where I had just come from and I had done an interview <laughs> and we all sat there and nobody said anything and we watched the entire interview and then uh, my mom looked over and said there you go <laughs> <laughs> and so that was the end of that uh, charade yeah no more mystery yeah that's right <laughs> absolutely um, so you know thinking about like gun violence in Chicago, which I guess has been, you know, well known now across the country for years, um, you know, beyond just obvious, the obvious problem in cities across America with just the access to guns being available, you know, what causes gun violence in these communities? It was interesting, like reading some of your, uh, you know, some of the reporting on your work and like news articles and, and talk about how like issues can just flare up in communities over lots of things and, and just lead to, um, you know, some type of response with uh, gun violence. Um, can you break down, like, what exactly is happening in communities like this? Well, in, in urban communities, I don't know, like Chicago, but definitely in Chicago, yeah. um, the guns, it's not the same gun issue that, that uh, right. we're experiencing in the country. Because um, these young people, these people uh, uh, in, in these urban areas just seem to come up with guns and lots mm -hmm. of them, more of them than people could imagine and, and more high tech versions of guns. You know, the, um, yeah. I know some people who are in military or uh, in a high levels of law enforcement have been like, wow, I've never seen one of those before. And um, they come from some mystery source uh, right. that nobody seems to be even trying to find out. Uh, what it is. And, uh, and so as a result of these guns being so available, I knew a, an 11 year old child who told me he could get a gun easier than he could get candy. And, and so, um, yeah. you know, they have, they have these guns. And once they have these guns, then of course, um, the anger issue, the listening to the songs they listen to, the coming from where they're coming from, uh, the first thing that uh, any kind of disagreement or or uh, something like that automatically becomes uh, what what used to be a fight now becomes a, a, a shooting incident. Yeah, yeah, wow. So, I mean, it's interesting your point about like where the guns come from because it's not like the situation you get with, you know, someone, a mass shooting where someone buys a gun, where these are guns are just, I guess, kind of being trafficked um, around right. the country to people and then they're using them. Um, yeah, it's 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 really weird to think about this because, like, you know, I, I've lived in you know different places around the world, and you know, living in Europe, where like this issue is so non-existent in comparison to the U.S., it's it's tragic that that you know American society just kind of, for lack of better words, just kind of looks the other way. It seems like, right? Um, yeah, it's really, it's, it's, it's different. It's different yeah. in the urban community. I mean, we have met the amount of mass shootings we have. Um, yeah. compared to the country and ours barely make the news yeah well that, that's the other thing that, that it drives me crazy because uh you know, i mean I, I live in you know downtown indianapolis area and so you know there are shootings that go on you know all the time um similar to chicago and you know it's just you talk to people around the country and people just it they just don't it doesn't really register with them it's kind of like and I think it's, you know, to a certain extent, the same mentality that you get with mass shootings at schools where people just instinct instinctively think to themselves, well, it's, it's not my kid that's getting shot. So it's not my problem. And this kind of hyper uh, individualistic culture that we have just seems like we're just turning the other way too often to these issues and not take them seriously when, you know, uh, by global standards, this is crazy how, how many shootings are going on in American communities. It should be unacceptable. I don't, 
I just, it's hard for me to fathom why this is tolerated so much. I, I assume you, you know, being at these crime scenes after they happen all the time must be hard for you to, you know, register, you know, how can we continue to let this happen? Um, well, you know, for me, I'm, I'm kind of in a, uh, almost a different space than the uh, violence reduction, uh, um, you know, arena. Yeah. I, I, I'm, I'm more concerned with the care Sure. And love of, of the people who are are directly affected by it, um, and so. But the, I, I realize there is a, a certain level of recidivism in terms of you know going out and getting, you know, some revenge for it that yeah. may be stopped by what I do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and it's almost like I, I told someone the other day. It's almost like um, I'm not treating. I'm not trying to find a cure for the common cold. Yep. Yeah. But I am really working on some of the symptoms uh, yeah, you know and definitely. so uh that's that's where i am you know i think about where the guns could possibly uh come from or a lot of people say to me was that a gang thing was that a drug thing and i'll oftentimes just say i don't know that I, I, I don't that's not my department sure, <laughs> so to yeah. speak um but rather you know i know a lot i know probably more than uh just about anybody uh, you know non-law uh, enforcement in Chicago um, about the situation itself because I am on the inside. I'm on the ultimate inside. And being a pastor, people speak freely around me. So I've heard some things said that yeah, nobody has in, in details. And, and I keep very close data on everything that happens. Uh, and so, um, you know, I work on that, what I call real-time data which is different than what the average person is putting out sure. um, in Chicago. And so it's like, hmm, you know, the number of the number of issues and problems that may um, put into this, uh, uh, I see from, you know, a different perspective, a closer perspective. And, and so, um, you know, my, my take on everything is, is a lot different, unfortunately. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, yeah, you, you have a, interesting perspective since you're dealing with a different angle than a lot of people are thinking about, you know, how to help these people after it happens. Um, and so uh, that's vital work. Um, have you ever had any issues in the community where like, you know, some people are kind of upset that you're sort of getting involved, especially if it's some, you know, if, if it's something between, you know, potential gang violence or whatever, are there people that are ever kind of like, like annoyed that maybe you're trying to interfere with, with something by, you know, helping families or, or do um, people, you know, I never, never yeah. had, That's um, good. you know, I, I run into situations where, um, the people don't want the help. Okay. Um, you know, but I mean, that's one of the first, that's rule. I always call that rule. Number one, that God taught <laughs> yeah. me is that you can't help everybody. Yeah. Um, however, most people, um, once they see, you know, once I spend some time, uh, at the scene or with them or uh, caring for them or, uh, or whatever um, it might call for, uh, even if they were kind of uh, standoffish at the beginning, they, they appreciate. Yeah. I have, I've had people who've cursed me out and then three hours later, they're shaking my hand and telling me, thank you. Yeah. Being somebody that stands with me. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's kind of the thing. It's just like, yeah. Uh... I'm sure it's people can be skeptical if they don't, especially if they don't know you, never heard of you, and you know, you show up, and they're like, right. "Who are you?" Um, yeah. But uh, well, a lot of people know me now, thank goodness, yeah. because of the TV. Um, yep. But it's it's a, you know, uh, it's a thing of the excitement and the emotion at the beginning of a scene. Yeah, and definitely. As it, as it kind of calms down a bit, that um, could because the people who who I've had trouble with. It's always in that first little period. Yeah. And so, um, you know, now I know that, you know, I kind of let them know, well, I'm not going anywhere. So, yep. <laughs> you know, um, you can curse me out all you want. doesn't bother me. I've had worse. And, uh, and I continue. Um, like one uh, gentleman recently whose daughter was killed, um, he, you know, in the beginning was very, you know, like he, he kind of had that everybody is the police uh, okay. kind of yeah. feel. And then uh, he went through some emotions, you know, with his daughter uh, being passed. And at one point he looked back and saw that I was still standing there, you know, and he was, you know, I could see that he kind of accepted like, wow, he's still 
with me. Everybody else is gone and he's just not going anywhere. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you know, it, it almost became, I became like the spokesperson for him actually. Oh, wow. You know, okay. People would yeah. ask questions and I would, I would be the one to answer him because he wasn't saying anything uh, at that point. And, uh, and he went along with them. When everybody went, he would ask me a question or two. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, you know, so it, 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 it's, it's about the work. It's about the energy. It's about the, um, you know, a lot of people think I pray, like I, I go running up to people praying, right. you know, at a crime scene. And uh, I let them know that I rarely pray out right. loud at yeah. a crime scene or something like that. But it, the presence uh, of, of, of someone who's there to love and someone who's there to care genuinely sure. without yeah. the agenda Yep. Uh, makes people feel very well and and that i think the um, non-agenda and the care just because for care's sake or love for love's sake is the thing that causes them to let down the guard yeah absolutely now that makes perfect sense i mean that's yeah how you interact with people matters especially if they think you're being honest with them or not so right. absolutely. um so now what in terms of your work you know what things do you think can be done and, and what have been successful when it comes to whether it's preventing violence or just helping, you know, families grieve, um, you know, what to you seems like the, the best way to, to do that? Just consistency, just yeah. being there for them. Like I said, I'm, the, I'm blessed enough to be there in the initial, yeah. um, you know, the down for day from day one type of person. They remember me and then and then I stay on them. You know, I actually work with my families for the rest of their lives. Oh, wow. So okay. There could, there's families who call me up five years later and say, I need a jug of milk and I'm going to make it happen. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, or other fam, unfortunately, other family members die and they, you know, get shot and killed and they call me or their cousins, you know, families had that situation and, uh, and I, I'm, I'm there for them. And so uh, um, the, that that love brings about uh, uh, a certain level of calmness and care and genuine care, and so that that will cause people to, you know, calm down in the situation. And calming down in that situation could cause a lot of stuff not to happen that might yeah. have happened. Yeah. And and otherwise, I am, um, you know, when when called upon and people ask my opinion, which is very rare. Uh, <laughs> Um, I, you know, I'll let them know what I, what I do know, which is, which is quite a bit about the yeah. inside, the inside dealings of the, um, of the violence in Chicago. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, what, what do you think, what measures that the city of Chicago has done, do you think have been successful in, in sort of mitigating violence and what hasn't been? Um, the efforts haven't been, there we go. We'll put okay, those just in general, <laughs> we'll just it's put those working, two together. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They, they, you know, there are many people in the city that are doing great work. Yeah. Um, but in terms of, uh, the numbers and things like that, I think it's an ebb and flow, first of all. And I think when it, when it kind of slows down, then people jump forward and say, I did this in my community and the numbers drop, yeah. you know, and then yeah. three weeks later, they're silent. You can't find them anymore because the numbers have gone back up or whatever yep. the case may be. Um, but, you know, there, there are people, you know, I always say that the one of the only ways to solve this, the easiest way to put it, is one by one. Yeah. And, and so there are a lot of people doing programs and doing lots of things to help one by one, you know, in, in terms of the environment, in terms of their life comfortability. Um, you know, they don't, if they're a young man, you know, with a, with a family or with a baby or whatever the case may be, or even a young woman at this point, um, and they have a loaf of bread that they know where they're going to get, you know, or meat and potatoes or whatever it is, um, and help when they need help with rent or if they need somebody to stand on their behalf. Yeah. Uh, as long as they know that, then they stay a little calmer. But when people get hopeless and desperate, uh, that's when you have a, a change of atmosphere, and that change of atmosphere generally turns out uh, negative uh, and such. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I imagine, you know, like most problems that happen in, in you know, human societies, there's a combination of factors at play which, you know, cause 
uh, issues with, with violent crime that goes on all around the world. Um, and it just seems like it really takes a full community to come together to, to help you know, end that cycle. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to, to hear about your work. Um, I also, I kind of read, it sounded like, like you kind of serve as almost like a uh, intermediary between police and these communities. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I mean, it's, uh, there's a, definitely a, a certain level of tension yeah, yeah, <laughs> between uh, yeah. The, uh, the, the urban community, the black community and the police. Uh, yeah. I don't think anybody doesn't know that that exists, <laughs> right. but uh, I'm one who's willing to stand in the middle yeah. and uh, let the two parties, number one, know that they need each other. Yeah. At a, at a crime scene, the detectives need to talk to that mom and that, or that brother or that husband or that wife um, and that husband or wife, mom or whoever need to talk to the detective because they want to know something. Uh, and so, you know, there's a need for each one, um, you know, uh, when, when there's, there's quite a scene sometimes, you know, 30, 40, 50, 60 people standing in front of a blockade of police officers, um, you know, um, going crazy basically. Uh, and I'm there to just whisper in their ear, you know, you know, they got to do, you know, their process, they got to do this. Or sometimes information can be the thing. He's laying there because unfortunately it has to be part of the evidence right now. Um, and so when the, as soon as the, the officers, uh, the detectives get through doing what they have to do, then they'll, they'll come and get them and move them. But, you know, right now it's best if you want to catch those guys that did it, you know, you want to let them do what they got to do because we don't want them to do anything wrong. And then, and then you'll be upset because, you know, they didn't find the person or it's taking them too long. And so you, you kind of, you know, negotiate yeah. with the, with the high level of emotions and, and, uh, high uh, stress and, and tension that are at a crime scene period, you know, why a mom can't go over the tape or beyond the tape to her child, which is laying, you know, 10 feet away. Yeah. Um, you you got to explain to her, you know, you can't, you can't, they can't let anybody over it, you know, even you, but I, I guarantee you, I'll get the, get some information about it as soon as the detective or somebody who knows what's going on can get to you, you know, yeah. so you got to, and you know, I, I, and now at this point, I really know the scenes and the and the. Uh, I have a, a actual class that I, I I'm teaching to certain people. Um, oh wow! Called, called crime scene logistics. One is called crime scene logistics, which explains the police in the white shirt, the police in the blue shirts, the the guy with the clipboard, the guy with the camera, the guy who just you know looks like he shouldn't even be a police. He's a nerd. Yeah. He's, that's the that's the evidence tech. Yeah. You know, they're the ones who are going to say how many shell casings this person, why is he there? Why is it red tape? Why is it yellow tape? Does this mean that um, who's going to come get him, get my son when he, when he comes or, or things like that. So that's crime scene logistics. And the other one I use is called crime scene population, uh, which talks about everybody who's at a crime scene and the two areas that everybody kind of falls into that being victim oriented or event oriented. Victim meaning they know that John was shot and, and event oriented meaning they know that somebody got shot on their block or right. in front of the place they work or down from the bus stop they have to stand at or on the way home uh, on the route that their children take or whatever the case may be. So it all falls into basically two categories. And so I kind of put that together um, to show people who want to help in that situation. That takes off a lot of time and them being able to help by the fact that they are kind of familiar. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. With the scene when they come out, you know, mainly like pastors and, and teachers and things like that so that they can, you know, help the people who they they deal with every day. That's that's really cool. So, like, on top of just providing help to families for, and giving them information and, and, and helping them, you know, deal with what happened, you're also providing educational opportunities for people who also want to help out in the community then? Right, right, absolutely. Because in a lot of cases, they don't have a choice at whether to help out in the community. Right, yeah. You, yeah. you, you, you got a, uh, you know, your hoagie shop and somebody yeah. gets shot there yeah. or down from it and such and such. It, it affects your, your yep. bottom line. And then with, with pastors in particular, 
they want to know how to help, you know, what to do, uh, because there's a shooting and, uh, you know, or, or homicide, and that family is still living across the street from the church. They don't go to that church, but there's, of course, some care that should come from the church, but the church may not know, the church may not know how to do or what to do. Sending right. them a plate of food is not always, you know, <laughs> an answer, you know, yeah. uh, you need a little more more time and they want to help a little quicker and a little deeper. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, that's really, really important stuff. Uh, I mean, there's, yeah, just anything you can do to help out in that situation. That's right. That's and more informed help is bigger yeah. help. Yep, definitely. Um, so, you know, based on everything you've experienced, you know, doing this line of work and, you know, living in Chicago for so long, you know, what, gives you hope for like the future because i think oftentimes it for a lot of people you know when we when people see stories like this i'm sure for people living in the communities with you know violence happening on a routine basis it can be hard you, you know you can feel hopeless so what to you has been giving you hope i'm just the the like i said the individuals the families that i deal with and and taking them from point a to point b to point c and 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 uh even going to court with families when someone is caught, whatever, whatever yeah. it takes. And so that, that you see the change um, in a family, you see somebody grow. You, I have a mother now whose sons were killed. Her only sons were killed four months apart. And uh, uh, one thing that the first thing I was able to do after a while was introduce her to a lady whose two sons got killed three months apart. And, oh my God. Uh, and, and then, uh, you know, because I've done so many, it's like, and so, yeah. you know, and also finding out that now that that mother with the four month apart, she wants to get out there and talk to some folks and meet some folks and tell his story and, and help some folks who are going through it or about to go, go through it and be a spokesperson for what comes out of a mom or what, what a mom feels like um, when he was killed the day before Mother's Day and, and, and that type of situation. So, um that's the hope. The hope is 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 coming mainly from people who it has happened to. Um, yeah. You know, because there's so many people. I talk about it day after day after day, where I look on the news and see that I never thought it would happen here story. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And and nothing makes me want to you know throw something at the TV more than that. I bet. Uh, and and in Chicago now they ought to know that it, it can happen anywhere. I've helped people who. You know, the son was obviously in a gang. The son was obviously a drug dealer. And I've helped rabbis <laughs> deal wow. with it. His son's got, you know, whose child or children have been shot or their or their area of town where nothing ever happens. There yeah. have been a shooting, a homicide now. And so, I, you know, helping them know more about what's happening and, and being able to respond if something does happen again or whatever the case may be in areas that, you know, they generally thought, oh, you know, It'll never happen here. That's their problem, so to speak. Yeah, no, I think that's a, a, a great point because, you know, too often everyone, you know, people across the, the country, you know, just assume that, you know, gun violence is something, especially if they live in a fairly sheltered community, they feel like, you know, gun violence is something that's never going to be a problem, but really it can happen anywhere. And, you know, I think right. we're seeing this you know, across the country, you know, whether you know, someone's getting a gun legally or illegally, you know, the, the possibility for gun violence in the United States, it's, it can happen yes, anytime. Absolutely, because, like, we have a number of expressway shootings. Oh, a yeah. A great number of expressway yeah. shootings, and, and that's, you can't get away from that. You got to go yeah. home. And, and, and yep. also, the fact that if there are people who shoot guns recklessly, uh, at some point, they're going to get in their car and they're going to drive by someplace that may not be the place, you know, where they're used to or accustomed to. They they may want to go nice places to to a nice restaurant or something like that. And yeah. and and if they're at a nice restaurant and the guy they're looking for happens to pass by, I guess what's going to happen? Yep. You know, yeah. so uh, it's 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 interesting. Yeah, it's pretty much yeah. It's, I you think that would be something that can help rally people around, but it that yeah, it doesn't. That story of, you know, it's not going to happen to me, not going to be my problem, just continues on and on and on until it actually happens, as, as you've seen many times now. Um, you know, one thing I've noticed even 
now that it's happening in more diverse areas, I would think that the people would kind of rally around, how can we get yeah. this? But instead, they've got, you know, private security for certain communities now. Yeah, I just right, yeah. <laughs> so that helps. Yeah, uh, yeah. Let's put it, and we're going to get a gun, too. Is That's what it's basically, you know, uh, coming down to. Yeah. You know, a hired gun, but nonetheless a gun. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's such a, a, a culturally disturbing problem um, because, like, again, yeah, I just, you know, point to you traveling to other countries where, like, people cannot imagine anything like this ever happening. No. And the U.S. is just kind of like, you know, we've given up so much on the problem that now we're like, everyone, you know, get a gun and protect themselves because, uh, you know, there's basically no hope. And I, it shouldn't be that way. Um, I remember telling one of my family members at the beginning of COVID, I said, the, the things that make America, America, the freedoms that make America, America, are going to turn around and bite us in the butt. Yeah. As yeah. a result of this. Yeah. You that's, know? And it's happening worse and worse. Two days ago, you know, we got, yeah. we got a big, you know, thing to split America in half. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, or yeah. So, you know, yeah. uh, and... Uh, it's just, it's those things, you know, what is freedom? And I got the freedom to, to uh, you know, to carry, to bear arms, mm -hmm. but you also have the freedoms to, to, to step on this side party-wise or belief-wise, yep. which means that bearing arms for these two different groups means two different things. Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, yeah. so it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting to watch. It's definitely... A, uh, uh, USA at, at this time is definitely a, a, a interesting sociological experiment. I wish I was back in school. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much more fun to, to study in school than to live through, unfortunately, it seems. Right, uh, and there's so much more to study now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, so. Yeah, I mean, yeah, the political polarization is just like handcuffing ourselves. Is You know, we're just not doing anything to solve anything now. Um, right. We're just right. busy fighting each other. It's, it's, yeah, pretty, pretty depressing, but um, I think, I think your work, though, at the, at the same time just shows that, you know, communities can come together no matter the situation, and there are people that want to help and want to build that community and want to work together, and I mean, in many ways, you know, that's, that's, that's a good example of, you know, what can happen on a national scale as well. It doesn't have to be, Absolutely. you know, just every man for himself. Um, and, yeah. and, and that's one thing I'm doing now is trying to put together, build, construct a microcosm for the rest of the country. Yeah. Um, a template. Uh, I, I remember about a month or so ago, I was at a, at a community where there was a shooting, like right next to a park and there are children playing, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the shooting turned out to be minor but it brought all the neighbors out. And so I got all those neighbors together and say, why don't you get each other's telephone numbers? Why don't you form yeah. a telephone chain? Why don't you make it easy for elderly Miss Johnson to, 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 to text one of you all because she's scared to call or scared to look out or scared to come in the living room or anything like that. But you, you know she can communicate anonymously because you have a little more knowledge of what anonymous means nowadays. Right. So, uh, you know, and so that I felt that that was one of the best things that could happen. You know, uh, even though I wasn't able to help a family or anything like that, I helped the community, um, which will bond together and perhaps prevent some of this stuff. Yeah, and and so it 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 all works out either way if if you you know really work hard and really plan it. Yeah, that's 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 great. I mean, yeah, yeah. At, at the end of the day, you know, I just you know, every time I I. Think about the gun violence that goes on across the country. It just makes me think of, you know, think of all the talented people that we're losing on a regular basis around the country that could be making huge impacts on their society. And we, we just, you know, let it happen. It's just. Uh, you know, Absolutely. I mention that at every funeral. I mention it, it quite often. Of course, um, I had a five month old who was shot in the head and killed uh, last Friday. And uh, I'm going to be doing the funeral. Uh, uh, I, I've been helping them day by day get it together, but I'm going to be doing the funeral as well. And, and I know that that's one, it's kind of difficult coming up with what to say at the funeral of a five, yeah. five month old, not five year old. That's insane. Yeah. Five month old. And, um, but one of the things is that, um, 
you know, we're losing, and I say it, I've said it at other funerals, we're losing some of the things that we absolutely need. And there's nothing like going on a trip and then you forgot something, but you run to the drugstore and pick it up. But then there are those things that you go on a trip and realize that if you didn't have, it's almost detrimental to the trip itself. Yeah. You know, i.e. plane tickets. <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, yeah. i.e. home alone. You left little Fred at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, whatever the case may be, you, you've you left something that you really need. And, um, and some of these elders, some of these older people and their wisdom, you know, that we need. Uh, who knows what this five-month-old little girl may have become or the 11 year old or the three, four, five, 11 year olds I've done or the three, four, five, 15 year olds or the, or the, the four year old that got shot by her six year old brother because the babysitter brought a gun and left oh it in gosh. an open bag. You know, I mean, they're, you know, we're losing at a, a, an enormous rate. Last year, um, I go to Atlanta for a little sabbatical quarterly and the people there, oh, our crime's getting just like Chicago. And of course, I'm looking at them like, you're, you're an idiot. Um, right. <laughs> and then finally, we looked it up. You know, I was standing outside. I said, no, no, let's look up how many homicides you all had last year. And I uh, came out to like 154 or something. And I said, number one, we had 860 something. Right. I said, yeah. number two, we had more children under the age of 13 killed then you had homicides, period. And people are just, you know, almost want to yeah. cry and faint at the same time. So we're losing some some great resources. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I mean, at, as a result of this. I mean, yeah, the, the, yeah, the youth of the nation, you know, you're, you're losing Absolutely. so many people. It's crazy. Um, you know, we're not, you know, it's, we're not a war-torn country, so we shouldn't, you know, be having this happen. It's, it's yeah, really, yeah, really, uh, insane to, to contemplate. Um, so, you know, given all this that's going on, you know, what would be your message to people around the U.S. that, you know, don't really understand really what's happening and, and how bad it is? Um, you have a choice uh, right now as to whether you're going to work scared or not work and be sorry. Um, and so, you know, there's somebody that you can help somewhere that could knock a, a block out of this, um, this situation. And uh, until somebody help reaches out and helps somebody that they don't know, uh, you know, this is going to continue. And sometimes that person that they don't know is themselves. Yeah. And so uh, and, until people are, are doing, I literally, you know, saw something you know, a couple of things happen on TV and, and, and you know, God kind of told me and I ran out and ran toward the bullets uh, instead of away. And I don't suggest it. It doesn't have to be quite that dramatic. <laughs> but the right. fact is, you're a carpenter. You can help somebody on the other side, you know, maybe get their house a little more together so they're a little less distraught, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, you know. Instead of running on, instead of crossing the street, when you see that certain segment of the population walking toward you, walk toward them and speak. Yeah, you know, still be cautious, of course, if you're going to do that. But um, a smile could make a difference, especially with young people. Yeah, you know, because you know, hurt people hurt people, yeah. and if we can get rid of some of this hurt, then we can get some get rid of some of this hurt. Yeah. <laughs> Right. Yeah, definitely. If people feel like they're a part of a community that cares, that definitely lights brings up your day because you don't feel like you're, you're this isolated person who, you know, is kind of at war with the world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's true how little things can make a big difference um, in people's you know, lives. We have, we have a problem with hundreds of kids going to locations downtown or otherwise and just going crazy. Yeah, they did it last night. They did it at the Millennium Park, our main place, and one kid yep. got killed. And um, and so I asked the kid, um, as I'm prone to do, just walk up and ask. So why are you doing this? And she gave the most brilliant answer I've ever heard in my life. She said, "Or what?" Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. I was just like, "Thank you. I'll note that. Have a nice yeah. day, man." <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. you know, and, and that's, that's a thing for some kids. It's not the answer for every kid that's there. Right. Right. But if you get three or four of them, yep. you know, then uh, that lowers, that gives you three or four more kids who wouldn't be here otherwise. Yeah, definitely. Um, so what's the best way then for people to keep track of your work and also, you know, help support your work? Um, well, www.solutionsandresources.org. Um, somebody told me when I started this, name your company something people won't have to ask what you do. <laughs> and so <laughs> solutions and resources, we help with solutions and try to find resources. And uh, yeah. And also Street Pastors, oh, you can see it, there we go. Street Pastors, which is uh, the response you know, uh, unit, uh, mm -hmm. which is actually an organization that's in London. Oh, that, okay. Uh, I saw a documentary and said, that's what we need and started it here in Chicago. And by wow. the time they heard about it, I was, I was their hero to a great extent. I had done more homicides and shootings in one night than they had in, I think they said six and a half, seven years. Oh, wow. And so, um, so if anybody wants to, to reach me, you can probably Google Pastor Donovan Price, but solutions and resources, if yep. you remember that, then you'll find me. Yeah. And, and money, money. I'm a, yeah, <laughs> I, right. I'm a nonprofit. At first, the first little while I was scared to say that, scared. I felt it yeah. dimmed somehow what I did. But the fact is, um, people need money. People need help. The resources I provide, that jug of milk, uh, cost and we God knows the the, the gas I use now yes. <laughs> is a major thing. I need to have a fundraiser just for gas. Yes, uh, yeah. And so I need you know all the help uh, I can get. Awesome, yeah, yeah, definitely, yeah. It's a yeah, pretty pretty amazing what you're doing. So thank you so much for uh, you. You know, taking the time to to share everything that's going on, and hopefully we can bring some more awareness about what's going on and help you know people try to help out as any way they can. So. <laughs> I look forward to it. Absolutely.